Hey everybody, this is David Wilcock, and I am here with Corey Good on our now infamous Above Majestic set, which also is my lower floor here in Colorado. And we have a really cool announcement to make. I have decided to sign up for the Dimensions of Disclosure conference. Not only you, <laughs> but your better half as well. That's true. Both yeah. Elizabeth and I, she's holding the camera right now. So. Right here. <laughs> So yeah, we wanted to hear from you. We have to kind of have you talk in the background. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mm -hmm. we're very excited to have the both the Wilcox at Dimensions of Disclosure, and um, it's going, this year it's going to be in Ventura Beach. Right, it's in California, so right. all of you West Coasters can get there a lot easier than when it was in Colorado. Right, yeah. it's going to it's going to be on in the Marriott Hotel right off the beach, there in Ventura Beach, and. Uh, uh, it's going to be a much larger um, venue, up to 700 oh, people this time. So we hope that you all visit Dimensions of Disclosure and uh, sign up for the early bird tickets. I would highly recommend, we have a lot of other people uh, coming uh, to the conference to, to give speeches. I would highly recommend you get the VIP package. Um, check that out. Those will go very quickly. So another thing, Corey, that I think is important um, to point out is that just a couple weeks ago in the mainstream media, like mainstream, they're talking about a patent that the Navy originally filed in 2016, they got ratified in December 2018, it's on the books, any aeronautics company could develop an anti-gravity technology. Right. And when you see the picture, which we'll include here on the video, we'll add it in, I mean, that is a flying black triangle. Absolutely. And and it even says in the patent that it, it, it is a patent where it is generating gravity waves, it is reducing the mass of the object, it's reducing the inertia of the object, so when you're reducing mass, you have anti-gravity. Absolutely. Yeah. So why do you think the Navy would re release, and basically in a kind of a soft disclosure, tell the public they have the ability, or, or at least theoretically, the ability to do anti-gravity. Well, you also may want to note that in the same week, the U.S. Navy created a new program to make reporting UFOs much easier and accepted. That's true. So That's true. the Navy is uh, involved in trying to, I, get, I think they're trying to combat some of this controlled disclosure narrative that's going on. A lot of the Air Force is starting to put out. Right. Um, you know, the TR-3B we expect to be um, made public in much the same way that the stealth fighter and bomber were. Hmm. We'll be told about it. Oh, yeah, we've had it for decades. And then we'll see them flying around and it, it won't be so sexy and exciting. It'll become, you know, normal. I don't know, man. A mile and a half wide floating silent black triangle is pretty freaking exciting. Yeah. It is exciting. But it is also <laughs> amazing what can become normal yeah, to the population. True. I mean, people forget that in World War One you had these gigantic flying zeppelins that were utterly massive in size. Right. But they were weapons of war, and if you saw one, it was a very, very bad thing. Right. And this is something that we talked about uh, a couple of years ago, about this uh, slow narrative of disclosure, impartial disclosure, that they were going to start, uh, we we're, were going to start seeing pictures of triangles Right. Uh, on the news, uh, people are going to start seeing them more around Air Force bases and other bases. Like the stuff coming out of Florida that uh, Michael Sala was reporting. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, and I've seen triangles reported in the news here and there. Yeah. Um, so this is them slowly acclimating us to let us uh, begin to understand that there are higher technologies out there and that they're all going to be aggregated under a space force at some point. So they, they've got to start leaking it to us and, 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 and seeding uh, the consciousness in some way. Well, I also find it interesting um, what you've been saying is coming down the pipe regarding uh, undersea ruins mm -hmm. and also the stuff in the Grand Canyon. And so that's another thing that I think makes, it's, it's part of what made me want to do this conference because some people think that I, I mean, we hear this stuff online, oh, David was only in it for the money, David never really believed what Corey was saying. Or I'm blackmailing you. <laughs> yeah, none of that is true. Um, the reason why I know that you're telling the truth is because way back when we first met in October 2014, there was way, way, way too many things that you knew that I had gathered from literally dozens of different people. You knew code names. You knew things that were very highly specific that I had never put online. 
And so I understand that the narrative that has come through you, the narrative of the things that you've actually experienced, breaks people's boundaries. It, it's, it's a lot to take in. It's a very heavy new reality. But at the same time, what you're telling me now is that all of us on Earth are going to be confronted with some very shocking new stuff. So in case people haven't seen your Edge of Wonder videos, which I highly recommend, because I know whether I like it or not, it's not an ego thing, just when my name's in a video, a lot more people see it. Could you just tell us in this video what is going on with Antarctica and the undersea stuff off sure. the coast of Antarctica? Yeah, and by the way, Edge of Wonder guys, they're going to be uh, Master of Ceremonies yeah. at Dimensions of Disclosure. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, but uh, yeah, the um, I was given a briefing about naval um, uh, expeditions uh, around Antarctica where uh, various NATO navies had found ruins of uh, partially or mostly submerged islands that have uh, a lot of uh, signs of civilization on them. They had sent in... in the, now, where are these islands? Okay, the islands, there were two strings. Uh, okay, the, the two strings of islands that I were told about were between Antarctica and the tip of South America, mm -hmm. and another one between Antarctica, again, and the tip of Australia. So these are islands under the, under the sea? Right. They're not all the way down at the bottom of the ocean floor. They're, they, they're raised above the ocean floor, but still far below the surface of the ocean. So what are we seeing in these? Uh, first of all, how did they get the footage? Is it from submarines or what? They had several. Uh, there was footage from several different expeditions that I saw, and some of them were just a lot of uh, video footage of uh, silt coming up off of the ground, it's little dark shapes, you know, kind of obscure. Mm -hmm. But what was the, the coolest thing they had, they had a drone that w uh, went back and forth in, be in between the city streets, I guess you would call them, mm -hmm. and all of this muck was coming up from the movement of the uh, uh, underwater uh, remote-controlled vehicle, but it was using a uh, advanced secret type of radar that was shooting through all of the muck and debris and was getting crystal clear pictures of the, um, uh, the ruins. And when I first saw, I was handed uh, uh, like eight by 10 mm -hmm. um, photos like you used to get printed right. out. And it looked to me like they were crisp, black and white, high definition photographs. But they were actually all of it was obtained through radar imagery. Okay, so you're saying city, you're saying streets, you're saying ruins. Can we be a little more specific about what are these sites? Yeah, they're very dilapidated. It, it's not like you see pr somewhat pristine ruins with fish swimming around and that kind of thing. These are completely dilapidated. Uh, the, when you say city streets, they're, they're, these are crumbled buildings uh, with uh, pathways, which, which were obviously city streets between them. There, um, there are no... They're not standing structures. They've kind of collapsed in Ooh. on themselves, and they looked very Aztec. Okay. So, step pyramids? Uh, what could be uh, buildings that were colla mostly collapsed, like there were no, like it, there used to be right angles. Okay. You know, they're all collapsed. They've been under there for thousands of years as well. We're talking about stone. Stone. All stone. stone. Okay. It's not advanced technology. Uh, it, it was all like okay. stem, like Aztec, ancient Aztec looking. Uh, did you get Did you get any information about how old this stuff was? Meaning, when were these islands last above sea level? Eleven thousand nine hundred years ago. Okay, so this would be Atlantean, like the idea of Antarctica being Atlantis. That Atlantis was that the Earth tilted, and Atlantis was was more temperate, and then it flooded and froze, right? Right, flash froze. Okay, so. There's a lot of stuff under the ice in Antarctica that we've been talking about for a long time, but this is also more of the outlying areas. Yes, this was actually wouldn't be considered Antarctica. There were the, the they islands, were like islands, and from what they could tell, these islands, the tip of South America and Australia, also didn't really connect with Antarctica. Mm -hmm. But there were island chains to where it made it to where if there people could travel in boats easily, you know. Well, yeah, and if you look at a picture of Antarctica and then you have South America next to it, you'll notice the bottom of South America mm -hmm. kind of curves off to the right, 
and you can kind of see a, like what would have been a land bridge. Right. And also, and, and it, it wasn't just that the water rose. Because of the great catastrophe, there were areas of the ocean floor that sunk deeper and other areas that rose higher, oh, that as well sense. as on, on uh, dry ground. That happened as well during Just the like with <laughs> the Lake Titicaca, Peru, where you got 11,000 feet above sea level, you can barely even breathe up there. Right. But they have all these ruins up there. Right. All right. Well, the one other thing I wanted to make sure we got into, because I think this is a really big thing, is... Okay, so let's go back to 2009, and I started to meet Pete Peterson. I met him with Project Camelot. Uh, Kerry Cassidy and Bill Ryan were both there. Um, I financed the trip out. We filmed everything, and then Pete and I began talking like two or three hours at a time, like two or three times a week, ever since 2009, up until recently when he nearly died, and now he's in a nursing home. Y'all became quite close. But from a very early time, and I just want to tell everybody this, too, because I have, if I wanted to go back, I always taped my calls with Pete, not to be used for public distribution necessarily, but for documentation, because he'd say so much stuff, and I was worried that I'd lose track of every, I mean, there's no, even if you're typing constantly, you're not going to get it all. So I have m m at least five or six different conversations I had with Pete that are recorded which I could go back and audit if this becomes of world importance, you know, which it looks like it could. Uh, I could hire somebody to go through all those tapes and find this for me. Um, we talked extensively about the Grand Canyon, and we specifically talked about a buddy of his who apparently had found certain caves that he could enter into in the Grand Canyon, certain crevices. We talked about this a lot, and, and we actually wanted to arrange a shoot, we never actually did it, but arrange a shoot with this guy to covertly go into these cracks because the guy had found skeletons, some of which were giants, most of which were giants. It was interesting because like there would be like this perfectly carved cylinder in the rock that would go straight down. The skeleton would be buried standing up, but it's a giant and it has an elongated skull. And so they were also apparently... I also heard th that there were ruins that this guy had found and that they knew about in the Grand Canyon that were very amazing. And another weird thing was, and I'm just putting all this out there first because I know what you've already said on other videos, and I want right. to, so I'm not loading you. In other words, you've already talked about this. Right. But the, uh, the content was also very strange in terms of that some of these folks in Majestic thought that this was validating aspects of the Book of Mormon. That there was like some weird connection to that with... But anyway, the, the bottom line was different cracks, different architectural sites, giant skeletons that had not been found, that were undisturbed, that had elongated skulls, and the idea that there's actually cities down there, ruins down there, that this guy was aware of it, other people Pete spoke to were aware of it. I've been hearing about this since 2009. But then you got a really cool briefing that they might actually... Anyway, I don't want to take the story, so go ahead. Yeah. Um, I was recently told that there was a U.S. Army retired um, person, I don't know if it's male or female, that was going to come forward with a whole lot of breaking news about what has been found in the Grand Canyon. And they, they, they told us that it goes back a couple hundred years when the U.S. Army uh, and the U.S. government came in and took over the Grand Canyon area because of what they had discovered, uh, what they had been told by Native uh, uh, American Indians that had lived in the area mm. about what was down in the area. So they went and did a, 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 a trip to go down to see what they could find. And uh, when they went down, you know, think back in the cowboy days, you know, torches going down these fissures, these cracks about like this from the picture I was shown that just went down into the earth and they were navigatable, easy to navigate, uh, not difficult at all. Hmm. And uh, the angles that they went in, it was the, uh, they weren't hard angles to walk. You know, it was like, a, was it like a major decline going in? It was a nice... Well, let me just add this real quick, Corey, too, because I was fortunate enough to visit uh, a, a site that used to be a major, major tourist attraction in early America, and it's in southern Kentucky. It's called Mammoth Cave. Mm. And you go in there, and there are so many of these caves. They're, they're, they're so large, 
and it's like this huge, huge, huge cave network. So you can walk in there for, for miles and miles. You could spend days trying to walk through Mammoth Cave. So that used to be a big pilgrimage site, and a lot of people, you know, would go. So it's definitely possible that you could have massive cave systems. And I would think also, just with the cracks, like the, the Grand Canyon is so big, you're saying some of these cracks go deep into the, the earth, fissures, right? Yes, they go very deep into the earth. They've uh, followed them for miles, miles down. And uh, as they go deeper and deeper, they were finding petroglyphs and different uh, uh, signs that showed that populations had moved through the area or had mm. been in the area. And as they went deeper and deeper, they started finding uh, more and more interesting things. They, they found uh, an area that had it was a giant cavern area but they had uh like um mud and and rock buildings adobe hmm. uh, buildings that were obviously extremely old there was shattered pottery around old uh, grain that they had located that they were able to carbon date so this is the one thing that i i i was hoping that ben and rob would ask you is okay you turn off the lights in Mammoth Cave, it's so dark you can't even see your hand in front of your face. Right. How did these people see? I don't know because there was uh, very little soot on the ceilings that would come from carbon from torches. So that, I don't know. Um, they were, you have to remember, they were brought down there by, um, what, what I was told was that this validates the Hopi legends because of the structures they found down okay. there. The pottery was uh, from that culture. It pretty much proved the so-called myths of them being brought down during before a cataclysm by ant people. Um, right. These ant people, we ended up finding bodies of theirs down there as well. Um, and I haven't received information to know whether or not these are greys that they were calling ant people or a different species altogether. Well, but. When we were having our weekly show, one of the things that we never actually aired, because you had such a hard time with it, if you remember, you really, some of the triggering of the Super Federation memories was mm -hmm. so intense for you. But one of the groups that we talked about in those tapings was a group that looked like an insect. Right. And their head was ant-like, but I remember you said they had these little stubby antennas instead of yeah, long and antennas. and these big mandibles. Mandibles, right. Yeah, but there, there are a number of different insectoid type of uh, creatures, uh, aliens, if we want to call them that. Right. Uh, they're heavily involved in this 22 genetic programs that are going on, so um, I would assume that they were bringing the Hopi down in there to protect a genetic line of one of their experiments, possibly, and then to bring them back out afterwards. But it's not just uh, the insectoid type bodies that we found. They found a completely different area that was preatomite. The, uh, the, the giant skulls. elongated skulls, the mostly reddish hair uh, mm. that they found. They found a bunch of, they found a burial area of uh, not only the ant people in one area, but m many, many miles away. They found a burial area for the preatomites in what was also a. Um, I guess a secret observation post. Of, mm. it, it, they said what they figured out is that they think that the preatomites had a post there to be able to observe somebody else. They don't know who, and, and remain it. It remains secret. You know? So, so this perfectly validates what Pete's been telling me that I could dig up the phone recordings and pull it out since 2009. What you're calling preatomites is these giants with the elongated skulls that Pete's friend had found burial sites that he could still go to where they hadn't been disturbed. Yeah. It, well, the bodies, they had uh, ponytails. They didn't have hair on the rest of their head. They don't, I don't know if it was shaved off or Probably, if, they, yeah. if they didn't grow hair that way. But uh, there were some, they had uh, long ponytails that were braided, that were red, dark red hair. Hmm. Reddish brown, dark red hair. What are you trying to say here, Corey? I, your ponytail is... Uh... No, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, large braided... They your skull is elongating, I think. Yeah. Well, uh oh <laughs> But yeah, they had very large uh, braided uh, uh, red-haired braids hmm. that uh, came from the back of the head or the side or different areas. All right. So the other thing that I want to do here is not presume that our audience knows the Hopi legend. 
And I mean, I could do it, but it's probably more powerful if you do it. So could you just explain? It's probably more accurate if you do it. It's probably more accurate if I do it. Because I'm the Ancient Aliens guy. We've done Ancient Aliens episodes on this. And I even remember speculating on, okay, what were these ant people? And it is kind of like the low-lying fruit to say they might be greys because they're kind of ant-like. They kind of have a a buggy look. But basically, what's your telling of of the Hopi legend as it relates to this? Uh, Well, I believe that uh, what usually occurred in, in... those older civilizations, and even now, is that the religious religious caste is, uh, you know, they're going into these dark caves, they're doing all of these ceremonies, and they're coming in contact with these ant people or uh, beings that they think are sp- spiritual beings that are bringing them information about, you know, this is how you, uh, you know, uh, do agriculture. This is right. how you do this. And maybe these guides at one point, when they were consulting them, uh, after they had fasted and prayed and done ceremonies, and they went down, and these beings say, oh, well, there's going to be a great cataclysm now. We need you to gather your people to the mouth of the cave at, on this, by this date. And so mm. they do that. You know, the, the Mayans, you know, they gather their people by the mouth of the cave, and then the ant people say, follow us. And then they bring them down to protect them from this cycle of cataclysms, these... Uh, um, micro-novas and uh, the cataclysms that occur because of the cycle of the sun. Well, yeah, and so the Hopi um, talked about the suns, that there's the different mm. eras that they right. label as the sun. And part of what seems to be related to this the solar flash idea is that the Hopi say that there will be a blue star, something involving the sun and blue light or something at the end of our cycle. So they're expecting something's going to happen. Right, yeah, again. The, yeah. I, and I talked to Clifford Mahuti about the Kachinas and the different uh, the Blue Star, and and he's one of the elders from the Zuni he tribe. He is, and which is very close to the Hopi. Yes, and uh, a lot of what he told me is that you know the uh, Caucasians, and actually it was like a, a university in Denver that had gotten their ancient uh, um, myths and had interpreted them and interpret, interpreted them in ways that were not correct. So uh, if you go to my Sphere Being Alliance uh, uh, page, uh, one of the uh, Dimensions of Disclosure videos that Clifford Mahuti did, he talks about uh, that myth and gives what he says is the correct um, interpretation. Mm. But yeah, there is a blue star in, it, in, in that myth, and it's very interesting. I heard a lot about that blue star Kachina uh, uh, story when I first started coming out talking about the blue spheres and, and all of that. Right, so just just again to make it really simple, the, the Hopi legend that I remember talking about in Ancient Aliens was essentially that some kind of catastrophic thing is going to happen on the surface of the planet, right? Mm-hmm. And these extraterrestrial beings that are ant-like in some way, uh, which I wasn't really ready to go as far as to say, no, they actually have heads that look like ants, we kind of went for the grays at the time. But now I'm thinking, well, yeah, there are apparently insectoid types that have ant heads. So this is all going to become commonplace because the, the galaxy is teeming with life. NASA's now saying 40 billion Earth-like planets with water on them just in our galaxy alone. And apparently intelligent life is a very common template that just keeps happening on all these planets. And it turns into a more or less humanoid form, but it can have different types of the life that we see on Earth extending into intelligent life with, you know, the opposable thumbs and with the, you know, the physiology, the head, the eyes, nose, mouth, all that stuff. So the legend is these ant people show up and rescued the Hopi and brought them inside the inner Earth to keep them safe from catastrophes on the surface, right? Right. So how would you be safe? This is something you covered in the Edge of Wonder video, but I thought this was a really good thing to add, too. How would you be safe in cracks inside the Earth if there's like a massive tsunami on the surface? Right, you know, the water, it's going to, you know, go you know, over the entire surface, and then it's going to subside and go into the places it was before. You know, gravity's going to right. pull it back into the places it was before. But the Earth, the crust is very porous. Water is going to feed in, into all different directions. It's... Um, not going to pour down directly down these cracks to where um, the Hopi were. You know, we like, also have air pressure that's keeping the water out. As so well. there's basically not enough water to fill all the cracks. No. Plus, as you said, and you made that point in the Edge of Wonder video, the air itself 
if you slap down water on top of it really quick, it doesn't, it, it creates a, a, a bubble. Just exactly. like if your car is sinking, right, in the water, mm -hmm. there's going to be that trapped air up at the top that you can breathe, and that's what they always tell you in safety class. Right. Get to the top of the car if your car starts to sink. So it's like a trapped air bubble inside the land that can happen. Yes. Okay, so the thing that I, I really think is important and why we're doing this conference, uh, we very much appear to be finally getting close to the edge here with disclosure. We're just right, right at the precipice. And I had, I, I sent you this uh, dream I had the other night about that I was on a cruise ship with mm -hmm. the Alliance. And we were celebrating that the, that the victory against the deep state had taken place. And you said some pretty provocative stuff after I sent you that dream. I don't remember what I said. Well, what you were saying was that within the insiders that you are talking to... Oh, yeah. It's not fear porn anymore. No. What are they saying? Tell, tell everybody. <clears throat> There's been a dramatic change in the mood and energy of the people that are briefing me. They have gone from, you know, this is a, you know, we, we don't know what's going to happen next. This, uh, this foe, you know, we know we're going to defeat them, but they're going to take down a lot of us. Uh, it's going to be horrible. It, you know, but they were, you know, trying to fight the good fight. Now it's switched over to where it's like they've, they were going up a terrible incline on a mountain and then they reach the other side and now they're coasting. So let's also bring this up because I think it's very relevant. This very suspicious fire at the Notre Dame Cathedral. The thing's been hanging out since 1200 AD or thereabouts, mm -hmm. 800 years. Never had a big fire at all. And with all the infrared detectors and smoke alarms and satellite technology, how could, and, and even just being able to scramble helicopters and stuff that, that would douse fires, how did this thing burn so big so fast and why? You know, I don't know. I, I was talking to um, an Alliance um, member that uh, is a retired general that's been following all of this very closely, what's mm -hmm. been going on in France and in, in Europe. And immediately when the um, church was on fire, he communicated me and said, you know, we already have confirmation this is arson. Um, and he said, we're extremely worried because there are a lot of um, um, artifacts and documentation that are inside that church that we that belong to the Vatican. It's one of their stashes, data stashes. Mm. It's something that uh, was on their list of places to raid and take the information, but because it was a church, they they couldn't do it until certain things had occurred first. And they said that uh, all of that evidence was more than likely lost. Wow. So this is sort of like the idea that if a criminal organization gets busted, they have like a dead man switch and then everything burns up. Exactly. It's that kind of a it's that right. kind of a thing. Right. All right. Let's also talk really quickly at the time that we're taping right now, there's been another weird story in the news, which is a Boeing 737 aircraft had 139 people on it. And it's coming in for a landing, but it misses the landing strip, and it ends up crash landing in the river. Thankfully, nobody died. But the really weird part, Corey, is that the news says that everybody on that ship was flying in from Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Right, to so, like, I think, Jacksonville Naval Air Station, from Navy Air Station to Naval Air Station. Man, I mean, and, and so let's get a, a backstory on... Are there tribunals going on? Is it happening in Guantanamo? Do you think these people were from those tribunals? I've heard that, yes, the tribunals are operating in okay. several locations, one of them being uh, Guantanamo Bay, that they're not moving along. They're not as massive as what some people are reporting. Uh, mm -hmm. Mainly what they're taking care of are a lot of the MS-13 types, people that were involved in all this human trafficking, and they're, they're taking care of a, a lot of people like that, and terrorists. Uh, they, they have... Um, just hearings going on uh, for these people, but the but people, you also said that that MS thirteen was domestically satisfying for the deep state, the same function that ISIS was satisfying for them over in the Middle East. Yes, exactly. So they're involved in gun running, drug running, human trafficking. Right. And I was told that not only do they have MS thirteen down there, but they have the intelligence operatives that ran them. There were intelligence operatives from Europe and the United States that ran MS-13. It wasn't being ran by some uh, nefarious person living in a cave somewhere. It was being ran 
from you know Langley and uh, and other places. And when we get back to the Vegas shootings, you remember that I mean I watched the videos. It's so obvious you can hear more than one gun going off. Oh yeah, simultaneously. And then there were people. There was always this implication that there was this secret MS-13 involvement with the Vegas shootings. Yeah, and I also heard that there was a major tie-in also with Saudi Arabia. Um, that shooting, right. there was a major tie-in with Saudi Arabia and a prince and some... So, I, I can't remember so in other words, MS-13, in addition to doing all this smuggling activity, they might also be involved directly in planning and executing false flag attacks. They do, yeah. They, um, they gather... Um, blackmail information on people for the deep state. They murder people, like Seth Rich was killed by MS-13. Mm. Um, they um, get shopping lists and go out and, and get people together for the human trafficking. They, um, they work directly with uh, intelligence operatives to, to send information. They, they're a whole network that has Many, many different functions. So getting back to the 737 that had the people from Guantanamo in it, do you think that those people, that there was an a, a, a airplane hacking attempt to try to assassinate them, which thankfully didn't work? I think you stated that 7 out of 10 aircraft that go down, um, 7 out of 10 that's on purpose. Wow. So I think very likely they had tried to uh, over overcome the pilot's uh, ability to control the craft. Right. Um, after some recent uh, plane crashes, I think um, you had uh, postulated that they had possibly gone out and tried to disable a lot of these uh, autopilot or remote oh, yeah. control type of uh, technologies. It was the Ethiopian Airlines crash, and yes. you sent me that leaked video, Right. and, and you're seeing the plane, and it's, it's kind of going like this, like... The pilots are trying to make it They're go up. It, yeah. Somebody else is trying to make it go down. And it's literally like fighting itself mm -hmm. in the air. And then it crashes in this huge fireball. Yeah. So I haven't received a briefing on that. As a matter of fact, uh, I've got to leave here soon. We're going to have to wrap this up soon. Sure. Because when I get home uh, this evening, I'm going to get a, a little bit more of a briefing. And hopefully it will include what, what was around that aircraft from Guantanamo Bay that crashed. Because I doubt very seriously that it was... Just an accident. Well, on the Ethiopian Airlines one, yeah. I forget how many, but it was like 19 or 20 people from the UN Amen. were on that plane. Right. 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 It's very, very. Right. So, but, but the bottom line is that everybody is now saying things look good. They're on the exit ramp. It's, it's the downhill now. Yes. Most of the hard work is done, and yes. the next part is going to be really, really amazing. Right. And the, the, I guess the, the next part is just to sit back and not only watch the reaction of the public, but they're also on high, high alert for false flags. They're at right. a point now to where the cabal, all they can do is spin. They can't really fight back against what's happening because we've cleared out the DOJ and most of the deep state, but uh, uh, they're really expecting some serious uh, attempts at uh, false flag attacks. Okay, so the one last thing that I really think we should cover here is the unbelievable manicuring of our social media that's going on. Uh, we have now the term Alex Jones. Like if you send an Alex Jones link on Facebook more than like two or three times, they're going to take your whole page down. Right. And just simply like anything that has to do with Alex Jones, they're just going to ban it on a blanket level. And, and also the shadow banning that's going on. Oh, yeah. It, it is pretty amazing. So You're watching people's view counts going way down. Like right. we saw this with Edge of Wonder. They were right. always getting at least 120,000 views. Now they're down to like 30,000 views for everything. Right. It's really crazy. So it just seems like we're really at the final gnashing of teeth stage. And that's why I wanted to do Dimensions of Disclosure, because we need to stand in solidarity. They have, the, the deep state has tried so hard to create a, a fight to the death within the UFO community. And it kind of seems to have polarized between people who are willing to entertain the idea of a secret space program, which you were instrumental not that you were the first, because I've been hearing about this for over a decade before then. But you were the first one to want to talk about it on camera. I mean, Henry Deacon did for a while, then he disappeared. That was back in, like, 2007 through 2009. So this is not new, but then you have another faction of the UFO community that seems to just focus on Roswell and nothing new. So 
Could you just, again, right before we're done here, speak a little bit to that divide? Why do you think there's such a split going on, and, and why are we getting so slandered by our own community? Well, I mean, quite honestly, the our community has been infiltrated from the very beginning. You know, many of the people that started the topic of disclosure were being funded by, you know, uh, Rothschilds and, and that kind of thing. So we've Rockefeller. Rockefellers, yes. Yeah. So we've um, we've been infiltrated and controlled for a long time. The, they they want to keep us talking about Little Green Men and Roswell. They don't want us talking about all the things that we've started talking about in the last four years since you and I started working together. So um, we have a lot of the um, compromised people that are lashing out right now, and we have a lot of people that are they're not compromised by just working for the deep state. A lot of them have been compromised by their egos have been fed, been told they're special, been given certain information, mm -hmm. and they want to keep those relationships so they toe the line. Maybe certain insiders that they get right, access to right. exclusively. So, you know, and, and a lot of it is also just these crazy energies going on right now. Uh, whatever, uh, you know, if many people um, in this community, they pretend to be more positive than they really are. And uh, with the energies coming in, this Christ consciousness, it's impossible. We're telling everybody what we really are. We're showing everybody what we really are. And I just, I also find it amazing, Corey, that this same group that we've called the Dark Alliance has just been so relentless. Like, if you actually pay attention to what they say, they are not objective at all. They are always anti Right. So what do you think is going on there? Why are they, why are they so resolutely, constantly, absolutely, 100% viciously hateful against us? Some of them are useful idiots that have been triggered. Um, a lot of them, uh, um, they've built this truth up for many years, and the truth that we're bringing out conflicts with that truth, so mm -hmm. they're reacting to it. But there's also a lot of manipulation going on. The false flags, um, the... Um, you know, coming in and, and stoking up um, fear and resentment and hate uh, against and between different people in, in this uh, uh, community. It, it, it's all been done to divide and conquer us. They know that this community, if we came together and started demanding the release of suppressed technology and really demanding disclosure, we would get it because, you know, we, we are the people that stand up and scream for it when everyone else is telling us it's nonsense. So what's the value in closing of doing something like Dimension of Disclosure in light of what you just said? It's a way for all of us to come together, show solidarity for the truth, and to also debate and talk about these different ideas and not just... Respectfully. Respectfully, <laughs> right, right. You know, that's, that's the main thing. You know, you, uh, coming together, we have different, a lot of us have different ideas, but we have the same goal, the same mission, which is to wake people up and to prepare for what is coming. All right. Well, I'm going to be there. Elizabeth's going to be there. You're going to be there. Yes. Sasha Stone, right? You said yes, that. Yes, yeah. Um, He's the guy who interviewed um, Ronald Bernard, the amazing yeah, whistleblower. And we'll put uh, some video up. Uh, Clifford so, Mahoudi, is he going to be there? Clifford Mahoudi. Um, we got Edge of Wonder guys. Edge of Wonder guys. Stand. We have some new people. We have uh, an NSA whistleblower that's coming. Really? Um, I believe, is, is it Robert David Steele? Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 He's, coming. He's, He's done a lot of great stuff. Former CIA. I'll just do that. John D'Souza, former FBI. Yeah, uh, we're going to have a lot of very interesting people. Uh, um, you know, Eisenhower. yeah, Laura, Laura Eisenhower. Eisenhower. Yeah. She'll be there, and uh, there are going to also, you know, be some uh, alliance people around, uh, rubbing shoulders with us. So it's going to be a very interesting uh, event, and we're going it, to. It, it's on the beach. We have a, also a beach event. We're going to show um, the follow up to Above Majestic. <laughs> So, I mean, it's, it's going to be a really good time. You know, go to dimensionsofdisclosure.com and you'll see all of the details. Cool. Well, I'll be there and I hope you'll be there too. Thanks everybody for watching okay. and we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching the Sphere Being Alliance channel. Make sure you click on subscribe and smash the bell to make sure you're receiving all the new content from the Sphere Being Alliance YouTube channel.